evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor to welcome you to Professor Daryai's lecture, The Muslim Conquest of Iran Shah and Its Aftermath, brought to you by ISA. My name is Niku, and I'm ISA's communication director. As members of Iranian Student Alliance in America, we we'll wish to increase the general public's awareness regarding Iran and the historical, political, and social issues affecting the Iranian community and to promote the Iranian Amer the American identity and culture. We want to encourage Iranians' representation and involvement in the American political arena and ultimately provide a forum to address to address and discuss issues concerning the greater Iranian community. Dr. Turaj Dariyai was born in Tehran in 1967. After a series of travels from the young age of four and attending various institutions both in Europe and the United States, he attended the University of California, Los Angeles, where he received his PhD in history in 1997. It is also our pleasure to have Professor David Stronach with us tonight. David Stronach has been Professor of Near Eastern Archaeology at the University of California at Berkeley until he retired in 2004. He has excavated at Pusargare, the capital of Cyrus the Great. He is undoubtedly one of the world's top experts on Pusargare. The breadth and distinction of his scholarship have earned him many honors and awards. Please join me in welcoming Professor Stronach, who will introduce Dr. Dayayi and talk about his scholarly contributions to Iranian culture. Good evening. I will just add a few words to Nico's remarks. The details of Professor Turaj Darai's curriculum vita are decidedly uh, impressive. Following uh, an initial appointment at California State Fullerton, he was appointed in 2007 as the Howard C. Baskerville Professor in the History of Iran and the Persian World and the Associate Director of the Dr. Samuel M. Jordan Center for Persian Studies and Culture at the University of California at Irvine. <clears throat> Dr. Darai is a prolific author, and apart from being the editor of the Nomie Irani Bastam, also known as the International Journal of Ancient Iranian <coughs> Studies, he's the author of many books and articles. Indeed, his most recent book, Sasanian Persia, The Rise and Fall of an Empire, received the 2011 award of the British Society for Middle Eastern Studies. But above all else, I wish to underscore <coughs> Professor Darai's versatility and his integrity. He has mastered all the necessary tools for his wide-ranging research. That is to say that he is an accomplished linguist, historian, and numismatist. He has a keen eye for social interactions, for the value of the history of food, for example, and for the difficult nuances of religious interaction whether between Zoroastrianism and Christianity, or between Zoroastrianism and the Muslim faith. Also, not being content with studying the Sasanian Empire in all its complexity, with, I might say, an incisive and clear writing style, he's taken up the challenge of understanding the history of Iran at the moment of transition from the end of Sasanian times into the beginning of the Islamic period. I want, for those of you here who are interested in early Iran, to have a sense, in fact, of all the many tools you need in order to acquire an appropriate breadth of knowledge in this subject. And I will close by saying that we are very privileged indeed to hear Turaj Darai on this present extremely important topic. Professor Darai. holding this because there's oh, or I could just hang it like a noose around my yeah. how about this fashionable fashionable great uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen uh, professor Stranach thank you very much for that very kind too kind of an introduction I wish half of those things that he said were true uh, I try my best 
uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, ISA, uh, what in Persian is called Hambasayi Danish Juana Irani Dar Berkeley, Iranian Student Association of Berkeley, for the kind invitation, as well as the Near Eastern Studies Department, where we have the distinguished professors, Professor Stronach here, Professor Azarpei, and Professor Schwartz uh, here before us, and also Professor Vivaina, who has come from Stanford, who is my dear friend. Uh, if you cannot hear me, I suggest you come a little bit uh, forward, and then uh, I think you will get a better sense of what is going on. Now, uh, the topic I've chosen today is something that is, I don't want to say dear, but very important to many Iranians. In fact, uh, I like to invoke or re-paraphrase something that William Faulkner has said, and so much has been repeated, even by President Obama and others, this quote, that the past is not dead, in fact, it's not even past. Uh, in fact, the Arab Muslim conquest for many Iranians is that if it took place just yesterday. Uh, it's somehow imbued in our psyche, the way we look at the world, the way we judge the nation state of Iran, but perhaps what I call Iran Shah from Oxus to Euphrates world, how it's turned out to be, and why uh, perhaps hasn't done the way we imagine it should have. And we also have a, a, in retrospect, think how things should have been or was in antiquity, and then what happened as a result of the Arab Muslim conquest. Now, I can't really say much more than uh, you know the lot of time I have here for 45 minutes or 50 minutes uh, about all of these matters. But what I will do, actually talk about today is, uh, according to my view, of course, a sort of a non-judgmental view of what uh, seems to have happened between, uh, let's say, the beginning of the seventh century, uh, 628, let's say, uh, with the uh, death of uh, the last great Sasanian uh, king of kings, Shah and Shah, Khosrow Padres, uh, who uh, struck these gold coins, if we agree that the, these are indeed his coins as opposed to Khosrow the first. Uh, I will begin from 628 and then uh, try to go all the way to the 8th century. That is for about a century and a half to see what is going on in some parts of Iran, so that doesn't mean that this is going on everywhere, and try to perhaps come to some sense of conclusion as how the Iranians reacted, interacted uh, to this great Muslim sweep that defeated not only the Sasanian Empire, but the Chinese, the Turks, the Byzantines, virtually everyone that they fought. Okay, uh, that is uh, what I will be talking about. So after the defeat of Hosro Padres, which has its own long history, which I'm not going to talk about, uh, I traditionally divide the end of Sasanian history into three major periods. The first one is the period of fratricide and the waning of uh, monarchic legitimacy. That's what I call it, at least. This is a phase of, indeed, disintegration in the sense that uh, Hosro's son, Kavad II, comes to the throne. And he is going to uh, eliminate his 17 or 18 brothers uh, that is having killed. In this way, you have most of the legitimate heirs to the Sasanian throne uh, being actually eradicated. That in itself is a great blow uh, to this uh, Sasanian empire. Uh, one of my students is working now on environmental history and plague. He is now writing on the plague of Shiruye. In fact, during the reign of Kabat, a plague seems to have taken place in Mesopotamia and southwestern Iran that had a devastating effect. We rarely think of natural causes, uh, the issue of irrigation, its upkeep, as well as plague, and the effect that it has on the economy and actually the politics, and that's what he's doing. And the plague seems to have been also very important which, according to some uh, accounts, led to the death of Kabbalah the second. And then uh, his son, Ardashir the third, who is uh, quite a young uh, boy when he's put on the throne, where the first real coup or takeover of power by a non-member uh, of the Sasanian family takes place. Uh, the famous Sasanian general, Shah Baraz, who had done wonders for the Sasanian military in the seventh century, in fact, uh, attempts and is successful at taking the throne. 
Uh, here's a piece of evidence that we have from Sebios, an important historian, Armenian historian, which uh, tells us that Heraclius, uh, the Byzantine emperor, uh, actually uh, tells uh, Shakhbaros to indeed take the throne. And this is, I think, unprecedented certainly in Sasanian history. That is, if we look at Sasanian ideology, the idea of the person from the family of Sasan is endowed with what we call khware or far as many of you know in Persian, the special ingredient that brings legitimacy to the Iranian world to the king, and where it's manifested in, manifested in various ways, including this halo as you see it around the king's head. Uh, is very important and it stated according to Sasanian ideology and in the Persian text it stays with the rightful king and of course the Sasanian king who is ruling over this territory called Iran Shah and the Shah and Shah of course is in that way. For the first time now we have a general who thinks that there is no need to be from the family of Sasan and in fact he could be in that with the Quadra as well. This is a great breaking of the tradition so not only you have now uh, plague and defeat, but also uh, the takeover of power by a non sasanian family. That is the first period of, I think, this beginning of decline of the Sasanian Empire. The second period, which I call factionalism and division, brings about a number of rulers, some of whom we do have uh, literary evidence about, so early Islamic sources, Tabari, Ta'alibi, you know, and the Persian sources, Bal Ami, you name it, they do mention them, and there are few that are missing, which we only have numismatic evidence. That is uh, evidence from the coinage, including Khosro the third and the fourth, probably, and the Pirus. So we know a series of kings are mentioned uh, Queen Buran, Azad Midokht, the Khosro the third, and the Khosro the fourth, and the Pirus. In between uh, 630 and 632, which is a bit odd, for about two or three years, you have about five or six uh, kings and queens. Uh, minting coins, apparently they're ruling. How is this possible? Is it that they are ruling one after another? That is the traditional suggestion that is given. Now, according to my uh, idea, that is not the case. In fact, you, what has happened is that the emperor, the empire has fractured, where uh, there are locations or provinces that a certain uh, pretender to the throne is minting coins, and then you have others in Iraq or Mesopotamia and in Fars and the close areas who are the crowned uh, king or queen minting coins as well. That is, uh, depending on the locality, different people are claiming uh, kingship. And many of these are generals who are doing this. The most important of these rulers of this period is Queen Buran. And Queen Buran is important uh, not because it's a, this is a woman who's come to the throne. Uh, what is important is that she is the last uh, ruler to try to restore order to this um, kingship. Uh, every single source, it's meager, that talks about Queen Ruler states that not only she tried to make peace with the Byzantines and return the true cross, uh, what was taken by post uh, but also to restore order within the empire and also restored the ideological breakage that had taken place with Shah Baras. Uh, for example, we have this beautiful, well, the traditional uh, silver coinage of Sasanians, and we know this is Buran, her name there, uh, the earrings and the braided hair, but then she also minted a gold coin. This is a medallion, special medallion, uh, which states Buran, restorer of the lineage of the gods, uh, which uh, I uh, suggest that is reverting to, or mentioning his father, Husro. He's saying that he's restoring the tradition of Sasan. So it's, there's ideological implications, but also practical implications with Huron. Huron is eliminated, uh, and while she's there or eliminated, we have these other strange coinage of a Husro, uh, and there are two sets. A Husro III, who probably is in Fars, and a Husro the first, uh, a fourth, who is in Khuzestan. So these, you might say generals, perhaps warlords, are minting coin suddenly in their own name. They may be the family of uh, Sasan, or uh, more probably that they are simply generals who have power, military power. Now my colleague and friend Parwane Pusheriati has written a very exciting book called The Decline and the Fall of the Sasanian Empire. I think it's a book about 500 pages long. 
uh, trying to suggest that indeed the reason that the Sasanian Empire fell was because uh, the House of uh, Parthians or the Arsacids, the Farrokhzad and Rostam Farrokhzad, the general, uh, the famous general who fought at the Battle of Padesia against the Arabs, uh, were from the family of Arsacids. And at the very moment that the Sasanians needed help uh, to fight the Arabs, they actually pulled, you might say, the rug under them and resulted in the collapse of the Sasanians. This is a tantalizing, I think, hypothesis and very interesting uh, in this suggestion. And we know that Azamidok is killed indeed by one of these generals. I think the important point is there is another general here attempting to take over the throne, regardless of the family association. The third stage of this Sasanian um, uh, fall is the period of Yazir the third, which I call the wandering kingship, where the king really does not have any power, moving from province to province, trying to uh, gain uh, uh, support. Uh, the numismatic sources, the coinage, beautifully demonstrate his movement. His early years coinage, yes, he, uh, he rules for 20 years. The early years, uh, we have his coinage from Farce, uh, from Mesopotamia, from Western uh, Iran Shah. As he moves east, those coinage, they stop being produced, and then central Iran starts uh, minting coins. And then finally in the east, Kerman, Yaz, and then Khorasan, or Greater Khorasan. That's exactly shows where his power is. Whenever he was in this location, the coins were minted in his And then it stopped. That suggests also to us that he doesn't really have that much of a support or support base. Now there are other interesting and tantalizing ideas about Yaz here as well, uh, about his character, his religious preoccupation. Um, an Italian uh, sinologist, Antonio Forte, about 10 or 15 years ago, wrote several interesting articles uh, about uh, Yazdier and his family, who apparently we thought had paid for the building of Zoroastrian temples in China. Forte has suggested that indeed these were Christian temples and not Zoroastrian ones, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but not to, again, for me to judge what it is, but we know if you read the Shah Nomad, it's a popular tradition based probably on the Hephodinomad version that the people who find Yazgird's body after the miller has killed him are Christians who give him a proper burial. So there is something about Christianity that seems to be lurking here vis-a-vis -vis the family of Sassan. And I should just also mention that we know that in the late Sassanian period, there is gravitation by the, a certain group, certain family members of the Sasanians and the nobility towards Christianity. And Christianity is quite popular. Now, if that had a hand in its support or lack of support, it's a hypothesis that needs to be proven. But all of this is taking place. So the conquest is much more conquest, at least what is going on internally, until we get to the Arab Muslim okay? okay? So, how did the conquest take place? After Yazgir is killed by a miller, as we're told, in 651 in Khorasan, at the order of Mount Uh we also come across the conquest. How? How did the Muslims conquer the Sasanian Empire? This is one of these questions that many people have tried to answer. And depending on your nationalist view, uh, if you have a nationalist view, if you have your you know, pro, pro Islamist view, your ideological view, if you're left or you, you know, uh, you're secular, you end up giving various reasoning and answers. In fact, there is, I think, a better study is to see what in the 20th century has been written about this event and sort of the ideological window of the authors than the event itself that took place in the 7th century. I was just mentioning to Professor Stranach when I was growing up, uh, reading in Persian mainly, since I didn't know any other language, most of the things I learned about ancient Iran were uh, through uh, translations of Soviet bloc historians into Persian. Oh, I can't make a This is who uh, was part of the Iranian Communist Party and the Tudeh Party. Diakhanov, Petrushevsky, the most important book on Iran, Islam in Iran, uh, you know, Granotsky, Paikulevskaya, uh, you know, all of these were translated into Persian. And that's how we 
saw and you know we came to understand not only the Sasanians but their downfall as this class-based society where the mobits are forcing the people you know under pressure and you know the people are sick and tired and they're willing to open the doors to the air most of if you've heard of this common story this is a very much a nice leftist uh, Soviet law historiography which was translated into Persian and we took it and Mazdak became this hero right this great revolutionary this is how we've gotten this idea. If you look at the sources themselves, there's none of this that you see. There's nowhere that says, yes, you know, these Iranians were opening the doors to the gates because they were under a class-based society that they were thinking of battle daddy and battle daddy brother of inequality. No, this is the writing of historians in the 20th century that has made the resonation in our mind. Especially if you were raised in Iran, that would be what would you have gotten at least. So when it comes to the conquest, we do have a Set of literature called the Futu literature. And the Futu literature are conquest texts, which discuss in somewhat of a general order uh, as to the siege and the conquest, followed by the subjugation of the provinces and the territories, and then the Futu in general. So if you look at the Lavari and the Lavari type uh, literature, that is the typical thing that you get. There's a a very good book written on this idea of Futu literature. What you may really call, uh, in Persian and in Arabic, you would call Rajas. It's really a boasting type of literature, where a group of people who don't have a great organization, as here we're talking about the Arab Muslim, are able to come and defeat this uh, empire that has innumerable army, well organized, very you know nicely dressed and so on, where there are these people in ragtags, and they have you know, no real organization, but, you know, God willing, you know, they're able to defeat the, these Persians uh, who are opulent and arrogant. This is the Rajas type of literature, of Belade, the Futu literature, that also has made a dent in our psyche, of course, but that's an uh, earlier type of literature as to why the Muslims are able to defeat the Persians or the Sasanians. So here's another historiography that is interesting. And this in itself, this Futu literature is also retrojecting into the past. They're not writing this in the seventh century when the conquest is taking place. This is written a century or two after the conquest. It's written as sort of uh, to try to boast to the Muslim community, to the Ummah, as to what had happened 200 years ago, how they're able to become the dominant group and the Zoroastrians and the Christians and everybody else are these subaltern sort of the minority religions under their power. Okay, so you must also be very careful when you look at Futu literature. You just can't pick up a lot there and say, oh yeah, conquered, conquered, conquered. You know, there are so many numbers of, uh, you know, Iranians and the Muslims are only one-tenth of them, but, you know, you know, God willing, and, you know, a miracle happens and we defeat them. Okay, so that is the literary evidence that we have for the conquest, which is questionable. Now, what I tried to do when I was much younger, to try to look at the textual, and the material evidence, the coinage and whatever we have in terms of material culture, next to each other, see the point. And try to perhaps guess how was this empire organized, at least in one province of it when I worked on it? How did it change as a result of this Muslim conquest? Uh, how are they similar and different in terms of reporting uh, how the conquest took place and its result? Now, rather than talking about a 250-page dissertation, I'll just tell you in about five minutes. Okay. Really, what it means to be done. Well, we know that in terms of the conquest narrative, we know the conquest took or began from Bahrain, uh, uh, forces going to Fars, where the caliph uh, Omar says uh, has a famous saying in At Tawari and others who says, "I wish there was between us and the people of Fars a mountain of fire, through which they cannot reach us nor we them." It's interesting that at least according to Tabari and some other authors, the Muslims weren't really interested beyond Mesopotamia and Fars. In fact, uh, the general takes or attempts to take Fars over on behalf of, on the behest of the Muslims is chastised by Omar. It seems that Iraq or Mesopotamia, Iraq was their in center of interest, and they wanted that now, be it because of its, you know, agricultural resource its importance in various ways, and the population makeup, which had a large, of course, Iranian and Aramaic speaking and, and Jewish and other groups there. That seems to have been the point of interest uh, to them. 
But it does happen that the conquest takes on because the, the Muslims, uh, while early on, are defeated uh, in several battles. And at the big battles, they are successful. The most important battle is the Battle of Odyssea. That is something that probably every Iranian who has read history knows about and thinks about even today. As I said, uh, invoking William Faulkner's uh, term, the past hasn't passed. Qadisiyah just took place yesterday. Well, it not only took place for the Iranians yesterday, mind you, during the Iran-Iraq war, if you've seen some of the graffitis and writings during the time of Saddam Hussein, uh, he also had, I remember a French um, author had uh, produced these beautiful war propaganda uh, drawings of the Iraqis that, you know, Rostam is being, uh, the famous Hussainian general, Sam Farah Sodan, is being slashed by Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas uh, and being killed. And under it says, as we destroyed the Persians, you know, 1400 years ago, we are going to defeat them again. Now, the French author didn't know that this Rostam is not the famous sort of Pahlavan Rostam in the Shah Nama. So this is this great Shah Nama, uh, you know, uh, you know, person. In fact, we were, Saddam Hussein probably was talking about, but, uh, you know, this Rostam. So this also gets played not only in the Iranian world, but also in the Arab world uh, and during the time of the Iranian world. So this has high sort of ideological, I think, uh, value uh, for either side. Uh, the battle that really uh, puts an end to the Sasanian Empire is the Battle of Nehavan in 642. We have the famous Mardan Shah, who has a very interesting career, a general who fights in Khuzestan, who fights at Nehavan, who's taken prisoner, taken all the way to uh, Mecca, uh, he becomes Muslim. He, we're told that he actually gives some secrets on how to fight the Iranians. Uh, by the way, we should also mention that there were Iranian elite cavalry uh, that did join the Muslims. So from uh, Iraq and uh, Khuzestan onwards, it wasn't only Arabs conquering the Sasanian Empire. There were Iranian elite cavalry who were also joined in uh, to conquer uh, uh, the Sasanian Empire. You might say, how could these Iranians do this? Well, we're living in the post 19th century, 18th century nationalist days, okay? For us, that seems sort of strange. But if you think of group uh, solidarity and their interest, uh, you could switch sides easily if you could keep your status and power and your wealth. That could happen. And Mohsen Zakari has written a fabulous book on the Ayyarun and the Sasanian elite cavalry, which if anybody's interested, convincingly has shown uh, this, I think, without a doubt. Now, this conquest, it, that, I'm not here to say that it was a you know, jolly event. No conquest is jolly. In fact, uh, what happens is uh, Mardan Shah is killed uh, by the way, once Omar is killed uh, by Omar's son. Uh, uh, Rai, uh, the city of Rai, uh, we we're told that accepts to pay uh, Jezia. Uh, 500,000 dirhams or taxes, Ardebil about 100,000, and it's at the time that Yazgir has gone to Kerman, Sistan, and Mahabhan has been murdered. So as Yazgir is moving up to Khorasan, these provinces are accepting to pay jizya and whatnot. And I'll talk about the methods in which the Muslims and the Iranians dealt with each other during the Islamic conquest. There were various uh, avenues of contact and decisions to be made. But we know, uh, according to the historical sources, literary sources, for example, if you look at the province of Fars, which I know a little bit more, uh, the city of Estat was conquered between 648 and 649, two years before the death of Yazgir. The city of Gub, Firuzova, 649-650. Shiraz, 640-641, much earlier. Daragir, 643-644. So there are various dates given for the conquest. Now, I have problems with all of these dates. What does it mean that a city was conquered? Because we know several of these cities rose up. Every time it was conquered, agreed, you know, there was slaughter. For example, Estaq is the most famous one. Uh, I forgot now who it mentions that 40,000 nobility and just cavalry are killed from the city of Estaq. The blood sort of flows into the street, uh, we are told. Um, I think Estaq mentions that. Uh, in Fars, you know, there are these round figures given 100,000 that are killed. Uh, and so what I think we can see uh, in the literary sources is not the numbers that are true, but there's constant revolt and resubduing of the cities. That is, uh, a city either loses or agrees to pay you know, their taxes to them. And then they install an Amir, the Muslims, and then the people revolt and kill that Amir. The Muslims come back again to squash the revolt and then killing goes on. And this is going on 
all through the 7th century, between 640 to 670. For about 30 years, about, about three decades, this is going on. But especially when Yazgard is alive and I think the century after that. Now, another evidence for us, besides the literary sources that sometimes may not be the best source, are the, as I said, the coinage, the numismatic sources. Not only the Sasanian ones, but what would be called the Arab Sasanian, especially the anonymous Arab Sasanian. Uh, so this, if this is a Sasanian, this is an Arab Sasanian. What is the difference? Well, it has a legend of Bismillah here. Well, this one is a bit later than anonymous. Hajjaj ibn, uh, Hajj ibn Yusuf's name is actually written in Arabic. But before this, we have the name of the Amirs written in Pahlavi uh, on these coins, which is, again, interesting. And the image of Khosrow, the sacred fire altar, the king's fire altar, is still there. But this is an Arab Sasanian coinage. This is a coinage that the Muslims have. By tracing these coinage, we know what years the Arabs were uh, controlling that city, and then you get actually a non-Arab Sasanian, a Sasanian one on top of that. That shows that people have revolted and are minting this other coinage. This way uh, gives us a very interesting uh, view of things. I have just to, again, as I told you, put this 200-page thing uh, short together. If you look at the last years of uh, Yazgar's coinage, with that of the earliest Arab Sasanian coinage, and compared with historians such as Tabari, Balkhi, and Beladari, uh, or three important sources for the dates that the cities of Ardashir, Kure, Bishakur, Dara, Gerd, Estah, Be'azami, Kobad, these are cities in Fars. As to when they were conquered, you come to some very interesting conclusions. And this is what the conclusions are. Dates given by the literary texts, Beladari, Tabari, Estakhri, uh, Balami, and others, for the conquest of the following cities are always earlier than the anonymous Arab Sasanian coinage. So the coinage, which I tend to trust more, uh, tend to say that these cities weren't conquered so quickly. And probably the first time the cities were conquered, uh, that date was used in the literary sources. Although the literary sources also uh, are not unison in their description. And that should tell us again that there were further revolts. Arab Sasanian coins begin with the first year after Yazgir's death. His rule was recognized till his death, at least in farce, at least the initial part. There are discrepancies for the date of the conquest and the literary and the numismatic evidence, as I have just mentioned. So, does the Sasanian Empire come to an end with the death of Yazgir? That has been the traditional idea. Nowadays, there's been further work done that while Yazgir was murdered in 651 by uh, an Iranian or miller from Khorasan, uh, Yazgir had sent his sons and daughter to the east, further all the way to China. Remember I t told you about Antonio Forte and his studies on uh, uh, what Yazgir was willing to pay in China. And we're told that uh, Piruz, one of the sons of Yazgir, goes to the Chinese emperor to ask for help. And indeed, he's given uh, a force of Turco-Chinese uh, army and is able to establish what is called the Second Persian Sasanian Kingdom in what we think is Zarang in Sistan. This uh, is also corroborated by Tabari. Tabari also tells us. So it seems for a while that while with the death of Yazgird, uh, things were all lost, there is this last effort by the son of Yazgird, one of the two, to come back and indeed establish something based on operation from uh, what we call now, of course, uh, uh, beyond a modern day Iranian a nation state. And uh, what we call the second Sasanian rule, Sistan. And this independence or rule uh, begins in 658, about seven years after Yazgir's death, all the way to 673. So still there are Sasanians in 673 claiming to be king of kings, legitimate kings, and they're there to take it back. So this idea that the Sasanian family were these weakling rulers who at the end just ran away is again another modern myth, uh, really, again, due to modern uh, historiography, uh, the way things are written in Iran. In fact, we know Piruz was in Sistan, and uh, by 673, we're told that he returns to China. And even by 675, he was attempting to take back the Sasanian Empire. Uh, I have written a short article about these very strange coinage of Yazgir, the third for year 20. We have hundreds of them from Sistan. 
And the question is, why these coinage? You know, he's, he wasn't there that long. Why there's this large number of coinage with the name of Yazgir? And sometimes on the margin, it has a slogan free. I have suggested that this, in fact, is the coinage minted by Pius and his other son. And since there were two sons, none of them put their names. In fact, they still uh, minted in the name of Yazgir, the, the last ruler that at least for many seem to have been important. We know in China, Pius was given uh, the title of general uh, as a grandee in the Chinese court. He seems to have built temples uh, in Xinjiang and died in 679. In fact, now, uh, we do have a statue that is in China with an inscription that my Sinologist friend has translated for me, and Forte, I think, has worked on it and done so as well, which uh, says, Piruz, the king of Persia, the general of the right flank and the spotlight of Persia. So uh, these Sasanians, at least, family was in China in the late seventh century. But that's not it. Peter's a son. Nasser in 679 is not going to give up and actually fights the Arab Muslims for another 30 years until 709 CE, until the 8th century CE, the Sasanian family is trying to get back the Sasanian Empire, where, of course, they're unsuccessful and come back to become the general of the left flank. There are still more of the Sasanian family who are trying to come back. The other son of Yazgir is Bahram who in the Chinese sources, according to Forte, is called Aluhan, who he has, of course, identified with the name Bahram. And he seems to have traveled to Byzantium, to the other side, trying to receive aid from the Byzantine Empire. So one son goes to the east, one son goes to the west, trying to gain help. Now, here there is a nice uh, Pahlavi, if you want to call it, poem. Sometimes people call it a Persian poem with you know, Pahlavi script. Uh, called Abarmadana Bahram Barzavan, and the coming of Bahram, the miraculous, miraculous power. It's a Middle Persian poem of the hope and desires of uh, the uh, you know Zoroastrians that Bahram would come and destroy the mosque, raise the mosque, and establish fire temple. This was always co connected uh, to the savior in the Zoroastrian tradition. Now, I think at a conference, uh, others, including Carlo Ceretti has shown that this, in all probability, is, in fact, Bahram, the other son of Yazgird, uh, who is being seen as the great savior, as he has gone to uh, the West. In fact, in the Bunda uh, an important Zoroastrian encyclopedic source, it is mentioned that when the Romans arrive and organize the rule for a year, at that time from the district of Kabulistan, right, from the east, someone will come whose glory is from the family of the Lord, they call him Kebahram. So it may be, again, a reference in the Bunesh and also to this other son rather than the savior that uh, we see in the Zoroastrian tradition and the two traditions perhaps coalesce together. Okay, that is what seems to have happened. Uh, here is part of that uh, text on the coming of Bahram, the miraculous Bahram. So when will he come uh, and you know save? Uh, Iranians and see what the Arabs have done to uh, this, you know, fragrant gardens of the Iranians that they have taken, so on, so on, so on. Uh, something that very much in the nationalist uh, circles of Iranians regarding Arab conquest, if you want to get its ancient text, just go to this poem and you'll see exactly what these people are thinking of the Arab Muslims, uh, probably in the 7th or 8th century. So this is the coinage or the last great coinage of the Sasanian world, uh, minted by uh, Piruz and Bahram. Even Bahram's son, Khosro, who in uh, Chinese sources is called Julo, or Julo. Uh, Johan knows Chinese uh, quite good in it, so he would be correcting my pronunciation, but uh, with apologies, is also mentioned to have uh, asked the Turks to help uh, retake it on chat, but is unable. To conclude, uh, I would say the first part, well, no, more than the first part of my talk, so if you could just bear with me a little bit longer. The fall of the Sasanian Empire was due to internal dynastic fighting. That we know and we uh, look at the three periods that I suggested, right? Generals of the empire militarized the empire, in a sense tried to take over the empire. If you know your Roman history, that sounds like third century Roman Empire or the 4th century, or the 3rd century, which is Barak Empires. 
sounds very much like where uh, generals or just uh, or armies are raising their own general as the emperor. Of course, the emperor sometimes lasts a couple of days and is assassinated, and then another general is raised. And that seems to be the case for me, at least in the late Sasanian Empire in the seventh century. So multiple rulers or generals ruling over uh, the Sasanian Empire. And as I mentioned, the only way to explain how so many kings and queens minted coins in less than a decade is that they were ruling at the same time in various ways. Also, only after 650, it is only after then that the Arab Muslims were able to mint coins in Fars. That's the province I know that they want. And the numismatic evidence suggests this theory but pushes the date back to 651 and 652, a year after. And I think there were ideological reasons why Yazgard III's coin in Sistan were minted with the year 20 because of the two sons. Lastly, the Sasanian family still hoped to conquer Iran Shah in the 8th century, so things aren't finished by 650, and Arab Muslims were able nominally to get access to the cities. Okay. Arab Iranian encounter. So let's look at practicalities. What happens when Arabs and uh, uh, Muslims and the, S the Sasanians or the Iranians meet? Well, there are various scenarios. One, uh, the Muslims give several options to the conquerors, or the, to the conqueror. Convert, become part of Islam. Or, accept Muslim rule, you don't need to become a Muslim. You pay tribute, but keep freedom, practice your own religion. But you can't do this once you fight, mind you. Either you submit right away, you can't fight and lose, and they say, okay, I'll pay the matches, yeah. By then, you probably are taken into slavery or your uh, women and children. You know, all sorts of nasty things come to you. It might be, again, like the Romans, what they did to the Carthaginians and sort of these imperial uh, forms of um, terrorism, I would say. Uh, or you could resist and fight, which ended in death, slavery, and paying even more for their release. That was even worse. And so these were the options that were put before the cities that were ruled by uh, Ostandar or the Shahdars, or sometimes the Magi or the priests. So it depends if there was a Marisman, if there was a Magi or the uh, Mulbet, that is a priest who was in charge or a general uh, protecting the province or the city to decide to pay a poll tax, uh, to pay tribute, or fight and die. And we have various versions of it, depending on the locality that we're looking. So the province of Fars doesn't look like province of Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan doesn't look like Khorasan. Khorasan doesn't look like Sistan. We cannot make general assumptions about the entire thing. Once every single province is studied, then one can actually bring together all of these studies and so Michael Morney has studied Iraq. I have studied Fars. Harman Pushayati has studied Khorasan. Uh, again, many other provinces remain to be studied to see what happened during the Senate transformation. Then you could make a better guess than what we usually do as sort of generalities. In the seventh century, we also find some very interesting copper coinage, uh, which I call independent or de dependent uh, lords. This is, uh, in fact, uh, during the Umayyad period. In the Umayyad period, we really think that you know Iran is part of this great Islamic empire. It's done, uh, but in fact, uh, things are not as simple as we see. Uh, we have coinage, and I'm going to spare you all of these people, but just give you the name of a couple of them, Azad, Mansur, Farrokhzad, and Dara, who made very interesting coinage. Rika Gislin is the, the sort of the master of uh, this period of studying these copper coins. And what we see are remnants of the Sasanian tradition, of course, in not very nicely done coinage. And they take place after the death of Ali, the fourth caliph, uh, in 661. Uh, where Moabia is attempting to control the caliphate. Uh, so there's general chaos, there's infighting between the Arab ruling elite. And at the, that time that there's this infighting going on, we find suddenly the uh, emission of these copper coins. Okay, and that is interesting as to the localities and sort of the, uh, you might call it imperial or the rule. That again reminds me something like the Persis coinage, if you know about the Persis coinage and the Parthians and perhaps, but uh, you have uh, people who are perhaps independent or dependent on the ruling elite and are allowed to mint coinage. Uh, so here's Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, the governor of Iraq and, or Iraq and Iran, uh, late 7th century, 8th century, uh, who has the typical Sasanian coinage, 
But then we get this type of coinage. The drawing is better because these copper coiners are in such bad shapes. At least you get to see the shape of it. Look, the, uh, the obverse is the image of a Khosrow type with a winged crown. Uh, Pahlavi, uh, there's the name of Farrokh Zad. And I think that is Khwara Afsud. Martin, is that correct, Professor Schwartz? On the side, I think that's Khwara uh, Afsud. It's still up, but there's Gadea Afsud. And there's Farrokh Zad, if I'm not mistaken. You get, yeah, typical Sasanian iconography has a legend of uh, And this is between 693 and 698. Okay, uh, now, and look at the iconography. You don't have a fire altar anymore. You have what I would call a Seymour, perhaps, a Seymour, which is very interesting. Why has the fire altar changed to a Seymour after the fall of the Sassanians? Here we have uh, a coinage of Farrell, so another one on the left hand side, and you can see why it's you know, not so easy to do that. Rather, the legend is good. I think what is happening here is that the local Iranian military or elite have come into an agreement with the Umayyads to create an Umayyad Iranian confederacy to sustain this empire of the Umayyads. That is, the Umayyads have agreed to deal with the Iranians. And this is so very different from the traditional, if I can use Shiite historiography of what has happened, Shiite nationalists. That is, your Shiite and nationalists, so you see, the, you know, the Shiism was good, it was the Arabs who were the bad ones, right? Uh, but what here we see is the, the Umayyads are the ones who are actually cooperating with the uh, Iranians, if uh, my suggestion is correct. So why, perhaps this is a wrong uh, term to use, that the coin is being de-Zoroastrianized, because Seymour is, of course, very important, but Seymour lives on beyond its Zoroastrian identity in Persian literature, and the Iranian tradition. I think perhaps something is changing, and the Seymour is, uh, you might say, it's kosher. It's OK to put on the coinage as a symbol of Iranian identity, except not a fire time or a fire altar. That is a no -no. OK? I'm just using this famous of dogs, birds, and bats, because my professor, Hans Peter Schmidt, wrote a 120-page article on Seymour in 1980, which I had to read. Well, no, I didn't have to read. I love it. Uh, with Farrokh Zad, just to mention one of these people as again, minted coins not only independently but has the name of these governors. Mohallab ibn Abi Sofra, Mohallab ibn Abi Sofra in uh, Tartus in Ardar Shirkhore, and with Hajjaj ibn Yusuf in Bishakur. So these governors and Farrokh Zad are minting coins together. This is fascinating stuff. Uh, and that tells me that they have come into this cooperation. Here's a coin of Mohallab ibn Abi Sofra, very much Iranian. Very much an Iranian coinage. Looks a bit, you know, crooked coin and the iconography, but in Ardashir Khorebi Shakur and Sak, we find these very interesting coinage of the two, perhaps. This is a Khosrow type coinage, of course, if you know Khosrow the second special uh, type coinage. Uh, Dara is another one of these fascinating um, people who has the legend uh, Azad Bishapur, which I suggest that says Bishapur has become free. Uh, and has the, uh, again, uh, legend, increasing glory, Khwarafsu. And here you have a ram uh, shown on the back of the coinage. What does that so signify? Well, Professor Azarpe knows best here, and uh, all the Iranologists, but uh, it's a symbol of Khwarafsu or glory. And that is one of its manifestations. If you take in Pahlavi, the first text you read is Karami Ardishir Babakan, you know that the ram was chasing the horse of Ardishir, and that showed that, of course, glory was all over. So what we could conclude is that the Arab Muslim conquest really did not end the resistance in Fars. What happened is that the Umayyads appealed to the local lords by making co-regency possible with a period of what I call Perso-Arab cooperation emerging between 680 and 705 until the 8th century. And just to give you this last time, uh, you know, Umayyad claims is very interesting. Uh, one of the Umayyad's rulers, and this is not the coinage of Yazid III, uh, but of course the name Yazid involves all sorts of ideas and uh, you know, some of our thoughts. Uh, Yazid III, in fact, uh, uh, is said to have been the uh, son of a, uh, Walid and uh, a noble Iranian or Sasanian woman, and in his genealogy claims that I am the son of Khosrow, my ancestor was not one. So we are here we've already seen this Iranian or Perso-Arab uh, sort of 
uh, you know, qual creation and becoming one, and in terms of ideology of the rulership. And it's with the Umayyads. It's the one that we farthest think that would have or be amiable to this Iranian hope. So with that, I'd like to end. I'm open for questions. If there's any. Um, you know, uh, I don't know anything about the coins, but I think about the language. And, you know, it seems like, you know, you're right, they went and took uh, Babylonia, and over there the language they speak is Arabic, and then further past them, the language is more Persian. So, can you tell us anything about that? Sure. You know, uh, this I, language diversity is an important issue in pre-modern times. We should remember the idea of a national language is a modern phenomenon. This is a modern phenomenon. Not everyone spoke Persian. I would contend actually what the Sasanians do, by the end of the Sasanians, they've actually Persianized the region all the way to the Oxus, where Persian becomes this language and part of this identity of what I call Iran Shah, which is so very important with an epic behind it, an idea of Iranian, this mores and values that is going all over the place. But we should remember they're Aramaic speaking, not Arabic speaking, perhaps, you know, understandable to some extent. Uh, you know, there are uh, Jews living there, right? Uh, there are all sorts of people living with so many different languages, okay? And they're interacting with each other. And we hear of, you know, certain language differences within the provinces as well. Uh, and so th there is variety. Now, Pahlavi was the language of the court and the language of communication, so it has some resonance more than others. You might think of Persian today as having playing the same role. If you don't have Persian as a national language or a language that is language of the court or the system, you know, no one is able to really interact with each other. It would be chaos. Okay, that is what's going on, I think, in general, in terms of the language. Sir, uh, so you mentioned that sons of Yazidis are the tribe to Try to uh, I guess, fight back or rule for 60 years, uh, all the way up to 7, uh, 8, 7, 8, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, we should remember that is an imperial uh, mentality. The king or the son of the king, the prince, the crown princes want to take the country back. That doesn't mean the military uh, men, those who have local power, uh, want the same thing. They want autonomy. They want to have their own power regardless of who's in charge. So, you know, you could have different interests and fight at the same time and cooperate. So, so the fact that uh, there was a dynastic uh, conflict, that could explain the fact that we, all those done, you know, as, I guess Dr. Prusharyati was suggesting that maybe the uh, seven yeah, houses, yeah. houses didn't, didn't support the society. That is Dr. Prusharyati's contention, which is, I think, quite interesting, and I would say tantalizing. I personally don't agree with it, although I think it's a great book. It, it really opens up so many questions. It's fantastic. Uh, but And her main thesis is the House of the uh, Arsacids, Parthians, are really responsible for this downfall. Uh, I think she's giving too much importance to the Parthians uh, as a uh, sort of one of the reasons. I think they're, these are uh, warlords in farce. They're not from the House of, you know, uh, Arsacids. So I think it's locality and interest. It's local interest, uh, sort of group interest. Sir. Uh, so, this, this, I think Simon was really interesting. Uh, I know the importance of it from the Iranian side, but do you think it's what it was chosen by the Arabs as well because of their nomadic background? No, no. I, I think Farouk Zad is cho choosing this symbol. It's an Iranian idea. And it's an Iranian idea that I think is, to a lesser extent, perhaps uh, at conflict with Arab Muslim mores and values. That is by the seven, end of seventh century, fire altars are not the, you know, the regular reverse symbol that you want to have. Okay, that's not what you. But a Seymour, 
which to an Arab Muslim probably doesn't mean much, right? Uh, but for Iranian tradition, is a loaded culture, it has loaded cultural value, can certainly be there. It's still Iranian, but it's okay to both sides. Yes, Professor Schwartz. Now, I, I was exceedingly struck, I think, any, anyone who's immersed uh, in this history is, is, is struck by, by that uh, substitution of, of uh, uh, for the fire altar. You showed uh, a uh, textile with a Seymour. What is the convenience of that textile? I have no idea. I've just taken that. Uh, the closest thing I can think of that is Prince of Persia. If you look closely at the film, there's a part that has these banners, and the, the banner of Seymour is exactly played right there in green. Oh my god. That's why I, I just took it from the internet. So I don't know if it's a textile from Egypt or if it's, it's probably not Egyptian, but the, so. The, uh, an art historian who's currently, presently living in, in Berkeley, Carol Beard, has done some very interesting research uh, on uh, Seymour. And uh, there, there may be a, a missing link here for her. And I, I think it, you should. I would be glad to. You should get in touch with each other. Absolutely. Uh, I'm very glad. Well, uh, I don't know if I understood right. Yeah, you referenced something to Shias, and, and the date was like 692 or 695 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And what I've heard, Shia was really started during Safavid. Is it, did it exist at that 680, time? 680, what has happened in 680? Why do I need Imam Hussein, it's Karbala. Yeah, but it's been killed. Shias that has already, I mean, these events, resonate and has made, you know, real impact uh, in, in the Middle East, in Iraq. I mean, in Kufa, uh, you know, and Iran, it's already, you have factions who are pro alit uh, you know, the, the faction of Ali. Now, what we call as sort of church Shiism, or, you know, what we call as institutional Shiism, the Safavids make it current in Iran as the official state religion, but certainly there are Shiite elements and family ruling dynasties in, you know, and in were Iran. Named already in the 18th century. Named Shia? Well, we call them Shia. They're, they're you know, the various type of uh, Shias. Uh, all the way up north in Caspian, Zaydis. Zaydis are up there as it is the Ziyaris. They're up there operating in Yemen and in the Caspian Sea, uh, by the Caspian Sea. You have certainly Shias in uh, Iraq. That is their center of power. Ali and, you know, why is it the battle taking place in Cairo? Because Ali and, uh, you know, Hussein, um, that is their uh, power base as opposed to the Omayyads who are in Syria. And what I'm saying is interesting that these local Iranians are making alliances with the Omayyads there, yeah. right? They're not doing so. Something else of interest, yeah, that, that I should stay. <laughs> uh, please, and then please. Yes, I know. I'm aware that you may be asking a very um, uneducated question no, in your field, but uh, nevertheless, um, Taking modern theories of the formation of the cultural self and cultural postmodern theories of cultural theories, things like that. What was the interaction between, let's say, the local Iranian mentality, and if there is even a possibility to say that there was such a thing, taking all the diversities of different genres, and and the incoming Arabic influence, because. I mean, I see these are like two very different cult ethos, uh, types of ethos. One is nomadic and conquering, and the other one is sedimented. And then, um, and then the question which is coming second to that will be, um, is there a possibility that the Iranian influence uh, can be counted in the history of Islam itself and separation of Sunnah and uh, Shia trends? Let me answer the second question. That was in, that was the traditional explanation in the 19th and perhaps early 20th uh -huh. century. Shia is Iranian and Sunni is non-Iranian. But that's really Iranian not. In what sense? It's not. It's, it's not. not. I'm saying that's not really the case. This is the south coast south of it that we get that sort of a viewpoint. Iranians were dominantly Sunni until the coming of at least if we don't have rough you know exact numbers, but uh, were dominantly Sunni uh, until the south of it. It's on the Safavid period that we get this change. Uh, your first question, in terms of the uh, interaction, well, what I try to show is that you have the leaders of these cities, uh, you know, 
either priests or generals or the mass want, deal in one way with the conquerors. Submit, pay, you know, jizya, convert, or fight and die and get. You know, that's the three type of general encounters that you get with them. Now, uh, go ahead. You know, did I answer your question? Or? Um, is there such a thing as Quality itself as a configuration, as a psychological configuration, oh. in comparison, and can it be compared in general with a self which is coming in with the Arabic conquest? And if you completely dismiss this question, I will. No, no, I won't. I, I think it depends what sources you look. If you look at Zoroastrian sources, there's certainly this idea of self identity. That dichotomy is clear. It's just really sort of the boundary is clear. Now, does that mean that's exactly what played out? You can never tell. We're making assumptions. You know, we need hard evidence. And one text here is saying one thing and one text saying that doesn't really tell us anything. It's not that clear. Okay. Uh, sorry, sir, and then I'll, I have to go here. Yes? Uh, I was going to say, what do you think the Sabbaths did? I mean, why did they choose to go become Shiites? I'm not a Safavid expert. I leave that to the Safavid expert. Uh, but I think in the 13th, 14th century, you have a rise of militant Sufism uh, from North Africa all the way to the Iranian plateau. And what you're getting is you get the militancy of Sufi orders, where the Safavids, I think, has uh, also attached itself to it. Uh, we made it one of the dominant groups in there. But that's all I'm going to say, uh, because I shouldn't really say more than anything. Yes. Well, um, I have two questions. One is that, um, do we have any literature on what the people, the common people or the commoners are feeling or talking about at the time of the conquest? Uh, no, because... Who are they signing with, if at all? No, no. What we're getting are texts from the Muslims, these Futu literature that say, we came and conquered. Then you have Zoroastrian texts written a bit after the conquest. That these people have come from hell. They look horrible. They want to, you know, they bury their dead. They eat their dead. They, you know, they kill people. The worst thing that has ever happened to Iran Shah, you know, in its history. It probably it's the end of the world. Please, the Savior, come and just put an end to this misery. Okay? So you get a religious view of a group that was probably the dominant group of these new conquerors who are now the masters. And then you have the converts who are saying, oh, look, the few people we came and killed them. Now, the common people, we don't know. I mean, if, unless there was our answer, if there was our answer, we would you know, suggest that that is what their viewpoint is. Uh, but we really don't know what the common person here did or felt. I gave a talk at UCLA, I think, last month, and there was this issue of, uh, I talked about Iran chat, this idea of Iran and an identity that I think comes about with the Sasanians and goes all the way through the, until the 12th century is really there. They said, what about the common person? Well, you know, when we look at, you know, we were talking about Roman history and so on, as my colleague said, you look at the elite. That's, these are the people who leave us writing. Okay, it's not the common people. Now, of course, we do have letters of uh, mostly economic transactions, and I think the largest group is now at Berkeley in the Bancroft Library. Uh, how many are they preserved? Oh, I forgot about 240? No, close to 300. 300 documents. These were letters sealed and signed that have come to light that Berkeley has it uh, from about uh, late Sasanian to early Islam, right? Six to 800? That tells you, oh, please, more right, go buy some oil, you know, get this jug of oil and give it to so and so. I'm worried about you. Write back to me what's going on. So, also, this idea of a Doran Sukkot, two centuries of silence that Iranians didn't write, is completely false. We have uh, Pahlavi documents all the way to the 8th century. Also, they're selling wine and exchanging wine. So, we know Islamic law does, did not apply in the 7th century to the Iranians, at least from this place, which seems to have been, according to Jinyu Surenava, that is Qom, what is modern-day Qom, where there were all these wineries that people were selling wine. It didn't actually apply there in the 7th and 8th century. So then Muslims didn't come with doors and say, okay, no drinking. That is not what it that seems to have happened. Okay. Please. Somebody have a question here? Please, sir. And we'll go back in. Yes, in regard to uh, Shiism and uh, Sunnism, I heard a version of this having to do with the fact that Iranians 
couldn't just subscribe to a caliph being the ruler because they highly valued this blood linkage as far as the kings were concerned. So they went ahead and said, okay, the prophet Ali was his first cousin, his blood was in his veins, and so on and so forth with his children. And that's why the Shiism really had its foundation early on. Because even though you said most of the Iranians were so inspired to the Safavid dynasty. So I don't know if that's... That's a nice version that we also in Iran have uh, grown up with as a tradition. Uh, but if we look at, I think, early sources, there's nothing there that tells us that the Iranians in mass or in general have that type of uh, you know, interest in this uh, sense. Okay, sir. Yeah, question about the coins. I mean, I kind of briefly what I saw from the, the coins you showed. Uh, most of them were just only either in the Arab script or in the Palladi script. I mean, have you seen mix of those things? No. What you get uh, Arab names written in Pahlavi. The intermediate period is there. So before Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, you know, Ubaidullah, I forgot his last name, Khorasan, his name is in Pahlavi. A lot of these people are writing in Arabic names in Pahlavi. So any coin is either fully in Arabic or fully in Pahlavi? That's right, there's nothing in between. Sir? Question about the, the famous story about the wife of Imam Hussein considered the a priestess of Iran, the daughter of Riyadh here. Is it true or is it just? Uh, well, Allahu <laughs> Alam. <laughs> I should say again, Allahu Alam, but uh, I should also say that uh, about five years ago, no, about ten years ago, the, the most interesting manuscript was found, I think, in uh, Astana Qutsar Azali, a text called Ali Nameh. This is a Shiite epic about Ali and his family, written in Persian about 20 to 40 years after the Shahnameh, which in fact is a dialogue of a sort of uh, interacting with the Shahnameh. You know, at the end saying that, look, this Shahnameh thing is just a story and fables of these people. If you really want real stories, you have to come to the epic of Ali, which has this tradition. So the earliest one is at least 40 years in Persian after the Shahnameh. So it's 11th century that has just been published. I've seen the manuscript being published, and I think it is in work to have uh, you know, uh, the edited volume, which has all sorts of interesting Irano-Shiite tradition, including that one, which became a popular story in where everyone was saying, well, this is a later tradition and you know, written about. Mary Boyce, I think, has written something about Bibi Shahbani and these I ideas. Uh, as well, but we now even see it all the way in the 11th century uh, as a textual Persian tradition as well. But again, as I would say, I'm not on that. Sir, I'm sorry. Uh, you touched just a little bit on you know, the modern nationalist paradigm when you look at these conflicts as something as you know, Iranian culture, Arab culture, you know, have been historically coming into contact and fighting, and you know, it was this geographic context. But at the time of these conflicts, was that kind of ideology existing among the people or, you know, Defense of everything that is Iranian versus you know this scary Arab culture, or was it just a question of warfare, geographic? You yeah, know? it depends on what source and what period you're looking. Zoroastrian texts are really clear about this. Arabs are bad because they've come and conquered. They've taken what belongs here. There are Iranian values that they have. They are defining. Okay, so that is clear in terms of what you see in you know eighth, ninth, tenth century Zoroastrian Middle Persian. You can't get away from it, okay? Uh, so there's that. Now, Arabs and Iranians being in contact, they have been in contact much longer than that. Much, much longer than that. Sasanians, in fact, the first people to uh, settle Arab tribes uh, in Iranian plateau are not uh, after the conquest, but during the Sasanian period. If you just simply pick up Tabari, it says during the time of Shahpur II, when he goes on a rampage and destroys you know, the, the south of the Persian Gulf, and you know, kills a lot of uh, the Arabs who take when he takes the title. He's given the title of Golaktaf, right, the piercer of shoulder. What is he saying? He's killed a lot of Arabs. And then the, the typical Near Eastern idea of displacing tribes and people in Kerman, uh, further up north and in Fars, wholesale Arab tribes are settled. So the Arabs are in, in Iran. It, it's not that there is this you know complete demarcation. Now what happens? There were walls uh, built uh, on the sides of the Sasanian Empire. Uh, to keep nomadic forces coming in, be it Arab nomads, be it you know, nomadic forces in the Northeast, or the ones coming from the Caucasus. 
so it's not air, but it's about, I think, people who are nomads and how to deal with nomads. Either you settle them or you fight them. Sir? I would I comment, this way. I yes. comment on one question. The comment is uh, regarding whether the, uh, the Iranians uh, embraced the Muslim invasion, uh, which, like you say, we don't know. It's not documented what the commerce thought about it. But I think of like the US invasion of Iraq where Saddam Hussein wasn't exactly a very popular leader, you know, he killed lots of people. So uh, your common Iraqi probably didn't like Saddam Hussein. Nonetheless, they didn't really want a, you know, a foreign government occupying their, you know, uh, their land and their homeland. So in that sense, I, I think, so my comment is that logic tells me that it cannot be that the majority of the Iranians, you know, openly embrace these invaders. Uh, and my question is, uh, how about the culture of people during that era, that end of the era of the Sasanians? Uh, like, for example, uh, did they have slavery in Iran at that time? Okay. I, they had it later, but they had the way it. you're going, I mean, I could pick your ideological sort of thing, but uh, you know, the idea of slavery, certainly in Mesopotamia, we have legal text uh, that uh, people could own slaves. You had uh, Bandage Shahrik, Iranian uh, slave, and you had Bandage An Shahrik, uh, non Iranian slaves. Uh, that is clear from uh, Mandigani Zardadistan, for example, the 7th century menace or proceedings of the Certainly there were slaves. Slavery was quite common in, in sort of in Eurasia. It's nothing outstanding to pick out uh, about the Iranians, uh, you know, say because they had slavery. No, the Iranians had it, the Romans had it, the Chinese had it. Everyone had uh, slavery. That was a common idea. So this idea of bringing freedom to slaves as sort of these, you know, uh, freedom projects, that was not really part of this mentality of late antique world. Okay. Uh, let me go this way, sir. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, lack of literature from pre Islam here uh, is often being played on uh, apps during oh, yes. libraries and all of things. What, what's your idea about that? My idea? Okay. Th not that it's you know the last word there. I think, first of all, uh, I'm now more and more pushing uh, with Professor Ravana. I've been talking again tomorrow. We have a number of Pahlavi texts, some fragments of a few page or half a page, to, you know, really major texts, probably 200 or even more. We don't even know on the number of Pahlavi texts we have. After 100 years of research in Middle Persia, we don't still know the name of every text that exists. So, but then we say there's nothing there. So first, let's see what's there, and then see what's not there. Now, that is just one aspect. That's my sort of point that I'm true. The other idea is, look, there were various types of literature there, right? What seems to have been of interest to the Muslims, you know, how the king ate, what they did, how to rule the country, you know, uh, cultural texts and so on, were probably translated in Beit al-Hikmah during the Abbasid period, right? This great translation, right? And Dimitri Gutas and others have written on this. Uh, and what they're doing is make, making uh, Khosrow the first court where they also were translating texts from Syriac and uh, Greek into Persian. And, uh, the, Abbasids are actually copying that tradition. So the texts that were important were translated into Arabic, and some of them later into Persian. Religious texts remind, remains with the Zoroastrians, right? Uh, they keep the texts that are important in terms of, so they can't keep up everything, right? Cultural texts, there are very few of them, because there's no use, to, most of them have been translated. And those that are not use of either religious circle or these fall into disuse and leave. Arabic becomes, by the 8th century, the the important language. That's the language you, you need to keep things. What's the use of having Pahlavi texts on how to you know, govern in the 11th century? But no one can read it, but there has been this language shift and change. And some of that gets used. Now, there's also destruction. We know, for example, when the, Arab, the Muslims came to Ketizaphon, apparently the archive did caught fire and was destroyed. In East, uh, they were forced to actually burning of books uh, further uh, to the Northeast Greater Cross. So it depends on the situation and I think the type of text. Uh, sir, 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 yes. So as you said, you said that um, the Arabs before attacking Iran, uh, they proposed to the Persian Empire to 
No, during the fighting. So you go to the city of uh, you know, Ardebi. You say, you have choice. You meet the local ruler out there. You want to fight? Okay. But you know, you're going to get killed, slavery, and okay. you have to pay double. Or you pay tribute, we'll let you have your religion. That's fine, just give us tribute. Or just become Muslim and you know, you're part of the army. Okay, so can we say that you know, they had more economical intentions than like, well, that depends on your text. Certainly, economic interest is very much important. I think Dr. Prushayat has also emphasized that. Uh, that it's the economic interest, of course, that here is at play as well with the Arabs and, and these people. That's certainly a viable. Sir? I was interested to know how much conquering Iran affected Arabs, like even in. Because I think Iran has this quality that sort of observes the people who come across it into its culture, like with Mongols, different Turkish tribes, even Greeks to a certain extent. Have you come across any information on how it affected not just Arabs that came to Iran, but Arabs in mainland, in Arabian Peninsula, mm -hmm. and? And how it affected their culture, how it affected their way of living? I think uh, <coughs> once the Arabs, of course, settle in Iran, what happens? The end result is they become Persianized or Iranianized. I mean, Persian is a language that survives in other languages. Arabic becomes a language of science and everybody knows. That is the important language of you know, knowledge. But you know, Persians does survive. And that suggests that these people who come, they settle and they part, become part of this culture. And I think that what you say as an Iranian, I can put my nationalist bit, is the beauty of this is that you absorb the conquerors, the people who migrate. I detest this idea of purity, that you know, we have, we have this original Aryan blood in all of our DNA, and somehow <laughs> these others have come. You know, these are just fabrications of, you know, 18th and 19th century, with all due respect, European sort of, you know, uh, romantic views, uh, you know. Uh, that, and that got translated, which I don't want to get into, with people, you know, Mirza Khani Kermani and Talibov, you know, and Salah and Norman, things like that, and that became co current, unfortunately, among some of our people. Which has never been the case. Iran has always been a mixed bag, if whatever you call Iran. This Iran says it's been mixed ideas and mixed bag. Okay, sir. Um, I was going to say, based on the numbers of Arabs and the battles that they for them to, you know, be able to completely control the whole area physically. But they could maybe, you know, move into certain areas and then pull back and then leave their leaders and have their leaders try to, you know, build build the society. And that's probably where you have all the mixing of, of uh, coinages and, and slow the, the constant revolutions. Revolts, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of mixing because it's such a vast area. Sure. Sasanians are an urban society. And they're created really up on the force of creating cities, and they do a number of them. Uh, if you always fly over Iran, you'll see that you know it's to a large extent it's bare, and not that it's always like that. It's these cities that are important. Remember, how many city, major cities do you have? How many of these cities can you control to say you control the Iran Shah? Of course, you're not controlling every village and everything. You control the major cities, right? You control the Iran. Okay? So I think that's the short answer to the long one. Sir, in the back, and then I'm going to come down and go here, and then I'll stop with you. Yes? So, um, about this kind of re emergence of kingship in Iran, uh, what was the extent of the rule, and why is this in Jordan? Oh, uh, because, the, well, Omayyads are centered in Syria and, you know, what we call sort of modern-day Jordan and Hosea uh, al-Amra, you have this wonderful, well, this is sort of more of a propaganda piece, so you have these six kings who are, or rulers who are submitting to the Omayyad rulers. In a way, the Omayyads are trying to portray themselves as this continuation of this tradition, and of course, Yazgerd or Bosra, whoever that is, is one of that. So you still find that under the Omayyads, you have sort of a nice, Hellenic and Iranian tradition surviving. Yeah, I want you to get out of this mentality, not you per se, but in general. The Arabs come, devout Muslim, destroy everything else, just, they're just praying all the time and they don't care about anything. <laughs> that is not the reality of what we're seeing here that is going on. 
Okay, it's much more complex. Depends on who you're talking about. The Khawarij, if you're talking about the Khawarij, they're very different in how they deal, not only with non-Muslims, but also Muslims in early Islam, right? But the Umayyads are not, this is part of the same period of the sort of What was the extent of like, the Iranian kingship, just because you mentioned? Well, I mean, we see that it influences certainly probably until, you know, Syria and so on. It did have an influence, although the Romans also had an influence. Sir? No questions here? Okay. Uh, sir? I don't know. My, my question goes back to the archaeology side of your, your research. Uh, your research is mostly based on the coinage, as you mentioned. That was when I was much younger. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to I see how, uh, how certain our coinage or our general scientists are about the age of the coinage. Oh, the coinage actually have dates on it. Oh, very good. So, uh, is it much better than text? I would say, oh, most texts. It's not all texts. I would say most texts. Anything else? For you? you want to know? I have a couple of books there. You could see actually. Uh, so they're giving some detail on the conquest of the black one. This is the same in one. Okay. Nice. Or did you have?